this is this is the one time where I thought I wanted to be in a band, like mm. in our band. And band's called Fairchild, with some of my best friends, mm -hmm. um, and we had plans to be the next U two. Mm -hmm. You know, that was what we that was like our goal. Yeah, and uh, and we were writing for it and working for it, but all the whole time. Um, and it was a struggle because I was like, I felt like I was letting my best friends down just even internally. But the whole time I, I was also leading worship and just having so much joy and is this, loving it. Sorry to cut you off. Is this more like mainstream stuff? Or yeah, is it, still it was worship? mainstream. So, so this is Phil Wickham, who's the worship artist that we all so, know. Yeah, that is time, doing kind of more of like a mainstream. Yeah. But it's, but it's in, in kind my of like mind, the, In my mind, the worship stuff was like almost like a tithe. At the t I was 18, 19. Interesting. Okay. And that was like, this is my thing to the Lord, but, also, but I'm going to be in a cool band. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and... Uh, but I had this like inner turmoil that I wasn't honest with myself or anybody else with, but yeah. I could feel the anxiety of yeah. just like this pull. Yep. Every time I tried to do the band thing, I just didn't feel mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And I was like fighting it for like mm -hmm. a year. And uh, we were there, we had gone with the church group over to play at this UK event. And uh, it was like this Christian thing, but kind of evangelistic. Anyways, it started raining um, really hard and everybody had to move into what was called the tea tent, mm -hmm. very UK thing. But it was like, that's where they had tea and it was tented <laughs> and they had like a little PA in there. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're trying to move the whole festival under the tent. It was pandemonium, crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, they finally got like a mic and a guitar line ready. They said, Phil, just go up and sing some of your band songs. And mm -hmm. I tried and no one was paying attention and it was like not even really working. And, and uh, so I was just going to quit until they had more stuff hooked up. And then the, the generator goes out and oh. the lights go out. Oh. It's just like <laughs> raining and no sound. And I remember going, so I went to the front of the stage. Oh, there must have been 2,000 people. Uh -huh. um, and I started singing, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. And, uh, and every Christian in the room that knew it started, it was just like everybody got silent mm. on a blackout. And then they were all paying attention. I started singing and they started roaring it back. Wow. And, uh, and no joke, at the end of the song, let it, let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Like the generator kicked back on. The lights came on. No joke. <laughs> and everybody's like, yeah. And for the next hour, just the sweetest, none of my songs, just like, the sweetest time of worship, wow. me and a guitar, and everybody's singing along. And it was like, God used that moment, not even to say, I'm calling you as a worship leader. Mm -hmm. just, I really did feel like he was saying like, look, yeah. just open your eyes, yep. see what's happening. Yep. Look, in, look in your heart right yeah. now. And I just realized how much joy I had in that yeah. moment, how much satisfaction, fulfillment, how I felt like I was right where I was supposed to be, mm -hmm. just singing, you are my all in all, you know, just mm -hmm. these old uh, 90 songs. And um, and that's when, that, that's when I really felt like, okay, I'm, I think God, God wants me to write. I, I know this is where I'm supposed to go. I'm mm -hmm. supposed to write songs. Uh, and then he just shares about how his story of just kind of transitioning into being a worship leader that we all know him as today. Here's the thing I want you to get out of that story. As a Christian, you have a calling on your life personally. And you've probably heard this from a YouTuber before, but I want to make this really, really, really practical. Not just like, yeah, oh, okay, God, yeah, yeah, I knew that. But no, no, what is that calling? I'm going to give you a few things uh, that scripture says are your calling as a Christian and help you find out what you're supposed to do from a ministry perspective as well. Because this is a point where I see, unfortunately, a lot of people who, who want to teach, uh, they really fall flat. Is it, they don't give you the actual applicable answers that the Bible teaches of what that calling is for you and how you can actually do it in finding whatever that ministry is. The first thing I want to say, you are not compressed uh, or boxed into being a worship leader or a pastor. Because of the, the structure of our today time American church, sadly, a lot of believers feel like they have been put in a position where there are two options that they have in life. Is there either worship lead? If so, if you're a musician, you've got this thing down, you're going to be perfectly fine. You're going to be good to go. And then your second option is you just have to be a pastor of a church. So I hope you're an eloquent speaker because if not, see ya. You know, I, I, I hope that you're somebody who can, you know, play guitar. Cause if not, see ya, you're, you've got no use in our church. And unfortunately, a lot of churches, at least, um, they, they won't say this, but subconsciously seem to imply that that ministry that you're called to as a Christian has to do with being in those four walls. And you can and should be serving in your local church. I'm not bashing that, but I'm saying if that is the exclusive um, or the exhaustive list of serving that you're doing, you've missed the point. This isn't, this isn't about you being in your local church. This is about you spending more time than just 90 minutes on a Sunday serving Jesus. So what does that mean that you do with your life from Monday through Saturday? Like, I hope, is this resonating with you? Like, are, am I the only one who's felt this? Like, I don't think I am. I remember feeling this way personally when I'm 17 years old and I go, man, I'm leading worship. I'm actually serving in the church multiple days a week in my worship capacity. And I'm like, this isn't all there is for me though. Like there's more that God wants for me than just to serve in the church two times a week. And I want to know what that is, God, but I need you to show it to me because for, for where I'm living right now, I don't know what that looks like. So then what I started doing is when I actually gave my life to Jesus at 17, I started reading scripture for the first time in my life. I just, I knew what the pastor had to say, but I didn't know what God had to say to me personally from his word. So I started studying and I started researching and I found out, oh my gosh, 
the gospels lay out so clearly what my calling is, but nobody, nobody's talking about this because it's hard. It's challenging. It's uncomfortable. Uh, what if my calling is way greater than what I'm doing on a Sunday? So let's look at what Ephesians chapter four says. This is in uh, verse 11 is where we'll start here. It says, and he, as in God, gave some as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints, which is you and me, for the work of the ministry and for the building up of the body of Christ until the unity of the faith is attained and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, brethren, do not be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and carried away by evil, or excuse me, every wind of doctrine and by the trickery of people and the craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects to him who is the head, that is Christ, who uh, is of the body, being fitted and held together with every joint supplies accordingly, or according to the proper working of each individual part that causes the growth of the body, the building up of itself in love. That is a little bit wordy, but let me break that down a little bit. There are five vocations. There are two views of these five vocations. It is either that there is a handful of select Christians who have these five, and their goal is to equip all of the rest of the church into doing these five. Um, again, apostles, prophets, teacher, pastor, pastor, evangelist. And then the second view is that we are all part of the five and that you are one of those five and that you are supposed to walk in whatever God's called you to in those five and then equip the rest of the people who are not what you are. So uh, let's assume you're a prophet. You're supposed to teach the apostles, pro uh, apostles, pastors, teachers, and evangelists how to prophesy and how to be a prophet biblically and so on and so forth. Those are the two views. I don't really care which one you hold to. I personally believe that everybody is part of the fivefold. That's my personal belief, is that you personally are either an apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist, pastor. Um, again, no one believes that you're one of the original 12. No one believes that you're uh, prophesying like you did in, uh, like they did in the Old Testament in regards to giving these global prophecies for the entirety of the body of Christ. Again, I think we're all on the same page that that's not what it is. But what does that mean for you in your ministry? If you can understand what you are in those five, it will help you Understand what your ministry is supposed to look like. So what is it that universally every Christian is commanded to do? You're supposed to love God. You're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. You're supposed to preach the gospel to all nations, right? That's Matthew 28. Everybody's in that position. There's nobody who's not in that position. So if you want to start with your calling, then are you doing those things? Are you currently loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Are you loving your neighbor as yourself? And are you preaching the gospel to all nations? Let me break it down in even a simpler way to, again, make this as practical as I possibly can for you. The first step is this. Are you having an upward relationship with God? Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying daily? And are you fasting? Is this something that's a regular habit in your life? That is the upward loving God well. Inward is loving your neighbor well. Is are you fellowshipping? Not going to church on Sunday. Are you fellowshipping with the body of Christ? Are you spending time regularly with the body of Christ, with the church, uh, representing Jesus well to them, uh, discipling them? Are you meeting the needs of them? Like Matthew 25, when you saw them naked, hungry, uh, in prison, etc. Did you meet the needs of them? Because whatever you did in the least of these, you've done unto me, Jesus says. Are you doing that? And then thirdly, are you helping outwardly? So upwardly, inwardly, and outwardly. Outwardly is you helping the lost person. Uh, and this is evangelistically. This is maybe meeting some of their monetary, physical needs that they might have. This is relief ministry towards the lost person. Are you doing those things as well? If you are not doing these first uh, three sets of things that the Bible teaches us to do, then I wouldn't even jump to these other things yet. I would put you in a category. If you're like, if, if you're saying like, I, I do very little of, of any of those things at all. And again, I'm not saying you have to be part of a weekly ministry that goes and feeds homeless people. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying if you're not doing anything with your upward relationship with God, if you're spending no time in fellowship and discipleship of other people, and if you're spending no time reaching the lost at all, then I would call you a baby Christian. If you are born again, I'd say that you're just a baby Christian. That's not a bash. That just is, is calling a spade a spade in regards to where you are spiritually. And that's okay. But right, just like Matthew 7 says, good trees bear good fruit, bad trees bear bad fruit. We know the kind of tree that it is by the fruit that it bears. And if it does not bear good fruit, let's cut it down, burn it up in an unquenchable fire. You as a Christian, we just need to call a spade a spade. We just need to see where you are and then address that and then do something with where you are. Uh, the other passage that uh, was just brought to my mind with this same concept is Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6 talks about like beginner faith, what that looks like, and when you're ready to press on to maturity. It says, therefore, leaving the elementary teachings of Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again, so saying not, not doing again the elementary things, which are um, laying a foundation of repentance from dead works, and faith towards God, so that's just like receiving the gospel. Instruction about washing, this is in regards to baptism. Laying on of hands, praying over each other. Uh, about the resurrection from the dead, that's in reference to Jesus raising from the dead. And eternal judgment, 
the fact that we'll be eternally judged one day. And this we will do if God permits, for it is impossible. And then it goes on to saying, you know, if, if you haven't received that, uh, or if you reject those things, then you can't be part of the body of Christ. But once those, once that foundation has been laid, then let us press on to maturity. If we're not even there yet, if we're not even at this foundational level of doing the simple things that God has commanded us to do, and again, I'm not saying perfection. I don't want people to misunderstand this and go, oh my gosh, it sounds like a workspace gospel now. Sounds like I'm completely hopeless because I'm not doing any of these things perfectly. Like, yeah, no, you're not. And I'm not, nobody is. Like, this is part of being a Christian. So again, I, I, I don't want this to sound like one of those things where you're just hopeless and helpless. That's not what I want to you to receive out of this. But I'm saying the next thing I'm about to say I want you to completely ignore if you're not doing those things. Let's assume that you are doing those things though. And you are doing them again, fairly frequently. Okay. Then what specific individual ministry has God called you to? Um, well, first off, I, I'm not even fully convinced. Scripture never says that God has given everybody their own specific individual private ministry. So again, I don't even know if that exists. Let's assume that it does exist for a moment though. If it does exist, or if you want to explore what the ministry things that God has called you to specifically would be, outside of just more of a generic, again, preaching Jesus to people, serving people in the church, etc., then you're going to find that through which of these five you are, right? So again, apostle, prophet, teacher, pastor, evangelist. Knowing which one of those five that you are is going to allow you to walk in that more proficiently. Because again, you're going to know which direction to focus or emphasize your ministry. So let's assume, uh, I'm going to give a quick definition of the five, and then I'm going to talk about specifically what some examples would look like. Apostle. Again, we're not talking about one of the 12 apostles. Uh, the word apostle in Greek just means somebody who is sent forth, or maybe like an overseer, administrative type position, um, who visionary, maybe you could even say. Uh, I know plenty of people who are in this category where they have great grand visions of what they can do ministry related, and they go and fulfill those things, and it's amazing. A uh, second is prophet. This is somebody who's, uh, again, they're, like their their vocation, the way that they are naturally is they are just prophetic in the sense of foretelling future events, in the sense of generally this comes with harsh rebukes, challenging words that they have to share to people. I'm not talking about people who you just hear say like, man, I'm seeing lilies and roses. Does that mean something to you? And the person's like, no, it doesn't mean anything to me. I'm not talking about that. Uh, there's a way that charismatics can do this that is damaging, hurtful, and is unbiblical completely. And again, I'm not talking about that please hear me. But there's a biblical way that you can do these things. And that is what I want to really expound upon. And that is, there is a foretelling of a future event where you can tell somebody, hey, I believe the Lord's sharing this about something, again, future related to you. Does that mean anything to you? And, you know, I, I have a friend personally who's in my life very regularly, and he does this a lot. And he's like spot on, like pretty much 100% of the time. It's really cool. So you've got somebody who's prophetic like that. You've got a teacher. We know what teachers are. This is generally what you see somebody doing on a Sunday morning, somebody doing YouTube videos oftentimes. That's a teacher. Then you have an evangelist. Evangelist is pretty common as well. Uh, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 tells us that all are to, to do the work of the evangelist. So we're all supposed to evangelize. That's not just the job of an evangelist. So don't be like, oh, I'm not an evangelist. I don't have to evangelize people. Like, yes, you do. Um, but some people, like, everywhere they go, they can't just, sh they can't, they can't, they just can't shut up about Jesus. Like, everyone they talk to, he just comes out of their mouth. There's this, uh, this guy who I um, was used to work with, and uh, he was a greeter at a grocery store, which is, like, one of the hardest jobs that you could possibly have. Um, when it comes to preaching the gospel to people, because everyone avoids you like the plague. They don't want to talk to you. They want to get away. They just want to do their shopping. And I, I would talk about it all the time. Like, man, I'm glad I don't have that person's job because it would be so hard to evangelize to people. And this guy came in there uh, and, and, and he did it to everybody. He preached just to 50 people a day, probably. I mean, it was like constant people were coming in and he would just preach Jesus to him. He's like 70 years old. He was amazing. Love this dude to death. But anyways, he's a perfect example of somebody like, he can't even help it. Like he was actually the pastor of a church for like 30 years or something like that. But no, really, I mean, Home Dog's just an evangelist. I mean, he would talk to anybody and everybody about Jesus and he just couldn't help himself. And it was just came so naturally to him. That's an evangelist. And then the final one, uh, I think the final one is, yeah, a, a pastor. Uh, yeah, a pastor. A pastor has nothing to do with somebody who's part of your local congregation who's teaching. Teachers teach, pastors pastor. Pastor is somebody who's a shepherder of the flock. Um, the secular uh, comparison to this would be like a, a, a therapist or a psychologist or something like this. Somebody who's going to help you uh, with where you're at and, and emotionally uh, and, and see how they can help you with the, the specific things that you're going through right now the counselor, like that kind of thing. That That's really what biblical pastoring looks like. This is a huge, desperate, dire need in the body of Christ. If I could argue that there's like more in one than another or something like that, I would say that the majority of those things would be, uh, majority of people, excuse me, would be a pastor. Again, could be wrong about that. That's total Cody speculation. But if there is any, that's what it would be. Um, because there's such a need for people to be pastored in the body of Christ. We have plenty of teachers, plenty of, you know, at least proclaiming prophetic people, et cetera. Now that you know what those five are, 
generally, unless you've been really confused by going to your local church and people telling you you're something that you're not, uh, which I have some friends who are in that category. Like, I don't even know what I am because my whole life I was told that I was just going to be the videographer. I was just told I was going to be the singer. I was just told I was going to be the door greeter. And so I don't even know what I am. Like, you know, so there is that category. But a lot of people go, man, I am that way where I'm, I'm just the chatty Kathy. Everywhere I go, I can make friends with anybody. Like, you're probably an evangelist. For, but the, for the person who's like, man, I'm constantly getting words about things, prophetic dreams, visions, et cetera, probably the prophecy guy. Um, if, for the person who's like, man, I just love teaching everybody and anybody always. Like my son is that way. My son's nine. And he is like, everybody he sees, he just wants to teach them about something, right? He'll have a new little, little Star Wars action figure. And he'll want to tell you the origination of it. He'll want to tell you what planet they're from and what, what happened in this specific movie. Like he wants to tell you the whole gamut. He just loves it. So I, I believe that he's going to be a teacher. Uh, when he gets older, he's going to be a teacher of the word of God. He's also potentially could be an evangelist. He loves being a real big people person. So again, my point is just to say, like, you can usually just tell by the way that somebody is born and built that like, this is something that they would be so good at. So that's the other one. Uh, and then again, for somebody who's pastor, they're the person who can, you can just cry on their shoulder. They'll listen to you. They have really good sound advice. That's more of the pastoral person usually. Now this helps you now have the structure and frame in how you do the ministry that you're going to go about doing, right? Phil Wickham, he learned that he tried to go to the world and find that calling in the world and it just wasn't hitting right. And he's like, man, this was the Lord's way of speaking to me that I should be over here. What is that for you? Like, what is it for you that you can say, man, I, I know what, I, I see it, I get it, uh, what I'm doing currently, but man, I really have a passion, a heart's desire for this thing over here. Do that thing. And also I'll say, a lot of times I've talked to people and they will say to me like, man, I've always, always, since I gave my life to Jesus, I've always wanted to do or say or be fill in the blank. And it's something ministry related. Like, but you know, I don't know, it's this and that logistically. 99% of the time you can do any of those things. But people think that it needs to be a job and they think they need to be doing it 12 hours a day, they have all of these silly ideas about this, which are just simply not true. And they're letting those things stop them from doing what they believe that they're called to do. Like, please do not be that person who lets these things stop you. Like, please, I'm begging you, be the person who just takes an hour a week, even if that's what it is, and do that thing that you feel fulfilled and called to do. And just keep expounding upon that. If you don't know what that thing is, pray and say, God, I want you to reveal to me what that is. I mean, for Phil Wickham, it was in him trying to build this secular band that was not working. And then finally... He had this really sweet encounter with the Lord in this moment on stage. And that was like really the point that was like nail on the head for him. So like pray that God gives you that moment yourself because he wants you to have that moment. For your sake, he wants you to have that moment. And for his sake and his glory and his kingdom, he wants you to have that moment. So pray that God would reveal it to you. And I'm sure that he wants you to know it way worse than you want to know it. But study these things out in scripture. If you're like, hey man, I think I might be the evangelist. Look at every evangelist in scripture and really see what they do and be like, man, how can I make this my ministry? And guys, not every evangelist has to look the same. Not every pastor has to look the same, right? You can be evangelist and evangelize just by making a bunch of YouTube videos and TikTok videos. You can be evangelist and go on a street corner with a megaphone if you wanted to do that. You can be an evangelist and you can just sit down with people in public that you talk to randomly. You can be an evangelist and just have a normal job and just talk to everybody there about Jesus. So it doesn't all have to look the same, but pray that God would reveal that to you. But again, I, I think that you'll find a lot of benefit and seeing that in light of what you are in the fivefold and finding out what that is will help you come to the revelation of what God wants you to do from a ministry perspective. But again, if you are not yet at the point where you're saying, I don't even know if I'm doing those first three things of the upward, inward, and outward, I, I, you need to start there because again, if you do not start there, everything else is going to always be slightly off because you're going to be focusing in the wrong place and the wrong thing because like that is the foundation of your faith is doing this upward, inward, and outward in regards to your relationship with God in your relationship with people. I'm gonna go way more in depth on this in a future video and break down all of these really in depth. So subscribe if you want to get in on that. 